Well, good day, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, one of our uh, Eastbourne Central uh, U3A lectures. And uh, I'm going to be talking in, uh, in two talks about the way that uh, the seafront, uh, the coast in Eastbourne, has uh, changed over time, uh, both by nature and by the actions of man. And uh, for want of a better title, I'm calling it Our Shifting Shore. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the Crumbles. And uh, the Crumbles is an area which I, I'm sure will be uh, a name, certainly, that's uh, known to everybody who lives in Eastbourne. And it's uh, but perhaps far more extensive uh, than a number of people uh, believe. Um, it's been created by the sea in fairly recent times, and therefore I like to regard it as Eastbourne's gift uh, from the sea. Uh, on, uh, the Normans called the area... Uh, on, on their maps, La Cromble, and uh, there's a, a, an old English word called chroma, uh, which in fact means crumbs or fragments, and that's about the, uh, the nearest that I can give you in terms of uh, an explanation of why the area is actually called the Crumbles. So first of all, uh, we're looking at uh, a, a map uh, that uh, it was drawn up round about 1820. The centre of the map is the, the, the village of uh, Langney. So it gives you some sort of orientation. And there was simply no, really nothing there uh, to speak of uh, a couple of hundred years ago. Um, the times have uh, changed a little bit. And that's the, the sort of uh, uh, area that we have in mind today uh, when we talk of the crumbles. But of course, these are sort of very recent developments. So uh, how, did, uh, how did the area sort of uh, look before that? Now here's a, a large, uh, a very large sky and, a, a, and, a, and a, an extent of uh, very flat land. And I certainly, as a, an old resident of Eastbourne, I can remember as a child, I was able to walk for mile after mile across the uh, crumbles. It really was a, a, a desert. In fact, uh, in, uh, in old maps of Eastbourne, it was often called the waste. So how did all this uh, waste land, this desert, uh, actually come about? Let's go back about 15,000 years. Now here's a, a little map showing the, uh, the southern coast of England and the northern coast of France in black. And the, the area that we now know as a channel is, uh, is coloured in uh, yellow uh, and in, in light green. And in fact, the nearest point to the sea, if you wanted to go and have a paddle, would be somewhere around Plymouth. So that's 15,000 years ago. So what's changed since then? Well, a lot has changed. This was really the end of the last ice age and masses of uh, meltwater, of course, came into this area as the ice sheets uh, melted. And uh, so what was a very, very large uh, river catchment area uh, called by many as the Seine Solent Basin, full of gravel, full of material, being added to even further by all the moraine from the glacial meltwater, uh, uh, really uh, gave a, a nice sort of uh, mixture of deposits that came in very handy later on. Now this is a, a, a map showing uh, the UK uh, about 8,000 years ago, still joined, of course, uh, to mainland Europe. And uh, the, the channel, as we now know it, uh, was still really not in existence. And you can see at the top of the map uh, over Scotland uh, that uh, we, we've still got uh, quite extensive ice sheets. And this is uh, really talking about uh, quite an important incident, uh, something like uh, uh, six or 7,000 years ago. And uh, you can see at the top of the map where it says Scandinavia, uh, you've got uh, a tsunami shown. Now, this wasn't just any tsunami. Um, an area broke off the European continental shelf and went at massive speed, hurtling down tens of thousands of feet into the, the chasm of the Atlantic Ocean. 
The size that actually broke off was about the uh, scale of Iceland, the whole of Iceland. And this caused a little bit of a ripple. And uh, this ripple uh, was in fact a tidal wave estimated to be about 200 feet high that came smashing over uh, the area that separated uh, UK and Europe, Doggerland and the Dogger Bank that we still know, to, know today and caused uh, a lot of chaos uh, in the area that we now know as the Channel. Again, a massive amount of material uh, being, being brought with it. And here we, we're jumping forward now to about a thousand years ago. This is the uh, Eastbourne area where sea levels are really a thousand years ago uh, up to the level uh, that they are now. And uh, the red area shows uh, uh, parts of uh, the surrounding territory that was actually permanently underwater, uh, fairly sort of shallow uh, lagoons and the northern part there extends as far as um, uh, Hailsham itself. So you can see the extent of the area that was permanently underwater. And then sort of something started to happen. And you can see on this map here um, uh, where it says uh, Eastbourne in the bottom left. This is roughly where the pier and the Queen's Hotel is. And you can see extending eastwards from there the gradual build-up of an extensive shingle bank because the crumbles itself actually starts at the Queen's Hotel. And you can see it uh, working its, its way along uh, and, and certainly just in the space of a few hundred years that lagoon at the back was completely enclosed and uh, uh, folk were able uh, to start reclaiming it as uh, a good quality pasture land took a great deal of effort but it was certainly worth the effort because the the quality of the pasture land was uh, uh, far far better than, uh, than than the downs for example and here we are we're moving forward uh, to uh, 17 1750 or so and you can you can see uh, the the light gray area which is in fact the existing extent of the crumbles but uh, below that, you can see a, a dotted line uh, that shows what the position was round about 1750. And you can see how this massive, massive uh, deposit of shingle and gravel was uh, about three quarters of a mile uh, further out uh, than it is now. So um, uh, 1750 was round about the peak of the, the build-up of all this material uh, creating the crumbles and since then we've had a steady process of uh, uh, a lot of the material being washed away again of a lot of uh, erosion taking place. Here's a map from 1820 and you can see the uh, little towns, uh, hamlets of uh, Eastbourne, Southbourne and sea houses and you can see the, uh, the area there of, uh, of loose shingle uh, which, is, which is now the crumbles. And uh, I talked about uh, erosion taking place and a series of Martello towers that uh, we'll talk about a little bit further in a moment were built in the, the early 1800s and all of them were built at least 60 yards from the sea. And certainly in the first 40 years, three of them were actually eroded by the sea. So that gives you uh, uh, an idea of how quickly uh, part of the, the Crumbles coastline uh, has been eroding. And uh, erosion generally in, in this uh, area uh, needs to be tackled because uh, if, uh, if nothing is done to improve flood defences, then parts of Eastbourne are going to be very vulnerable. And you can see here the, the groins uh, that we take for granted and sometimes we only see a, a few feet uh, sticking up above the shingle. But uh, you can see the work taking place there and it gives uh, an idea of actually how extensive uh, these structures have to be. And uh, here we are, it's a nice sort of little playground for Tonka toys, as I call them where now quite significant investments are being made in uh, shoveling around all, all, all the shingle to try and uh, keep the uh, sea defences secure. 
and of course I think many of us have seen uh, some of the material being sort of scooped up uh, in mid-channel and uh, redeposited on the beach. And the, the, the beach itself is sort of quite interesting. I, I, again, I can remember as, as, a, as a youngster, as I said, sort of walking for mile after mile. And the actual configuration of, of, the, of the crumbles is, uh, is sort of like walking uh, across a, a, a piece of corrugated cardboard, I suppose. There are uh, no end of uh, little humps and uh, hollows and uh, there's a, often a, a whole uh, line of ridges uh, that, uh, that have been built up by successive spring tides and storm tides and uh, locally they, they can be called benches or forms or some people call them fulls, F-U-L-L. -L. Uh, but uh, it's not, not entirely flat, it's a very uh, interesting sort of topography. Now I feel sort of obliged to show you um, uh, one or two pictures that contain almost nothing and that's the point. Uh, this is a, a, a photograph taken from Pevensey looking towards Eastbourne. The Martello Towers are there but the point is there's nothing else there. And again, I think it's a lovely picture of uh, uh, seas seas uh, enjoying the seaside round about 1900 in Pevensey. You can just see the outline of Beachy Head in the background, but again, there's absolutely nothing there. But having said that, um, there is something there, uh, certainly as far as uh, uh, um, for fauna is, uh, flowers and fauna are concerned. Um, look at this, 70 species of spiders, beetles, 200 species of moths and butterflies have been found. And just look at the, the richness of the original bird population with snipe, kestrel, peregrine falcons, kingfishers, etc. So a very, very unusual site and a very, very high uh, environmental and uh, ecological value. And I think this is actually a, a picture of uh, Viper's blue, blue gloss in the, in the foreground there. But it's also a place that needed to be defended, uh, not only from the, the threat from the sea, but the, the, the threat from uh, other folk as well. Because this was such a, an easy landing beach for, for all sorts of fleets. And of course, the, the, the Romans were, were building their castle at uh, Anderida uh, to uh, defend themselves from uh, Saxon raids. Um, they had to um, defend themselves from the French uh, on uh, a number of, of occasions. Uh, certainly, uh, the Normans uh, landed in this facility prior to the Battle of Hastings. Um, there was a, quite a significant raid uh, by 15 French ships in 1342 uh, on Eastbourne that actually landed here. And it's said that half of all the crops in the Eastbourne area were razed to the ground, were burnt uh, by uh, this, this French raid. And there, there were, in fact, a, a, a number of them. And then, of course, later on with the, the threat from uh, uh, Napoleon, uh, the, the whole string of uh, Martello Towers uh, were built. And uh, these <laughs> uh, were really quite uh, interesting structures. Um, they, they took round about half a million bricks to build and the, the rate given for building was uh, uh, six shillings per thousand uh, built, so roughly uh, 30 pence uh, per thousand of uh, bricks laid. Um, the seaside, uh, sorry, the sea facing uh, uh, aspect was about 13 feet thick and the, the land facing aspect was, had walls about six feet thick. And here's a nice little picture of uh, a fort that went with it. This was a fort at, uh, at Langley Point. Now, this is uh, an interesting uh, photograph. This was taken by the Luftwaffe. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, was uh, part of a reconnaissance exercise, uh, looking very carefully at uh, uh, this uh, particular crumble site because uh, this was uh, one of the uh, intended landing sites uh, uh, planned for the uh, autumn of 1940 for Operation Sea Lion. 
and here's um, the, you can see that uh, this part of the coast and Kutmir Haven was very much um, uh, part of the uh, German thinking. And uh, I think we were sort of a, a bit alive to this as well. And we started to build anti-tank traps and everything uh, across, the, across the crumbles. And it was really a, a, across the crumbles that a lot of the um, air raids on Eastbourne took place. Because the uh, uh, aircraft would come in incredibly low across the crumbles, because they could. There's sort of nothing there to uh, stop them. And... Uh, uh, do, do their business in Eastbourne. It was not sort of an uh, accidental dropping of bombs or anything else. It was really quite deliberate stuff. And I think this is a, a lovely uh, uh, text that's coming from an ROC observer in June 43. He's on the crumbles and you can sort of just imagine an excited voice uh, coming, coming over on the radio. I've got them, 6, 10, 13, no 14 blight is approaching. Southeast at 0, 050 feet, miles three, now one. 14 focal balls overhead with bombs attached. No hold it, correction. 13 focke balls overhead with bombs attached, one bob approaching overhead with no focke balls attached. <laughs> it always makes me Google that. And uh, the, the crumbles are also uh, used uh, for uh, uh, getting rid of uh, Eastbourne's waste. Uh, 1866 was the first sewer that was built from the centre of Eastbourne, extending through the East End and out across the Crumbles to Langley Point, where stuff really not very well treated, if at all, uh, was simply dumped into the sea. And this went on for sort of almost a uh, hundred years, uh, and it's only really in 1960 uh, that uh, uh, better uh, treatment facilities were introduced and then uh, fully compliant with uh, e EU uh, legislation uh, with investments made in 2000. Now, uh, some of the material on, on the crumbles, the shingle was really quite valuable. As early as 1859, the ballast line uh, from uh, the town centre of Eastbourne uh, was built uh, going uh, across seaside and out to the crumbles uh, to collect shingle. And the shingle was actually used uh, for the ballast of railways. Uh, uh, a lot of the uh, railways in the south of England actually had, uh, in early times, uh, ballast uh, from, from uh, uh, crumble shingle. And uh, uh, initially, the railway company would pay one old penny, one D, uh, per cubic yard of a shingle. And that went on until 1932. And uh, since then, of course, there's been a, a great amount of extraction for, for building work, etc. And the extraction from, uh, of shingle from the crumbles didn't really finish until the, the mid-1980s. Uh, now here's a picture of a, a little uh, narrow gauge uh, train that was used and used to take the, the material so it could be loaded onto a, a proper uh, rail wagon. This is the uh, uh, wagon, uh, the, well, the train that used to run uh, twice a day uh, 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 in, in, into Eastbourne Centre uh, carrying shingle. And uh, another attribute of an area where there was nothing is that it's uh, an absolutely wonderful place to build an isolation hospital. And this was Eastbourne's... Uh, uh, hospital for smallpox patients and was actually closed round about 1940. Now again, uh, isolation helps when you're smuggling. And uh, smuggling in this area uh, was uh, a major economic activity. It wasn't a couple of fellas with a bottle of brandy, it was on an industrial scale. And uh, it was certainly a, a favourite spot for the Mayfield gang, which was uh, uh, came from the high wheeled, very aggressive gang, but uh, certainly knew uh, their business. And there's one lovely story from round about 1815 when uh, uh, information was given to the revenue men uh, that there would be a particular incident at Burling Gap that evening. So the revenue men that there were um, all went to Burling Gap to find not very much going on at all. And meanwhile, 200 smugglers on horseback were unloading a series of ships on, on the quiet 
uh, welcome coasts of, of, of the Trumbulls. And this is a, a, a nice sort of little uh, extract from a letter uh, from uh, local uh, uh, smugglers to one of the revenue men. Sir, you'd better not be so hard upon us, for if you do, we will knock out your brains the first time we catch you alone in the dark. So, sort of quite, quite violent. And uh, we're going to stay on a violent theme, because I'm going to talk about the two nationally famous Crumbles murders. Irene Munro, 1920. A shorthand typist, 18 years old, very independent girl, lived in London, decided to holiday alone in Eastbourne. She was very fond of walking. And uh, she came a cropper. Um, one day, uh, a mother uh, out with her 12-year-old son uh, uh, came across something actually in the shingle. And uh, it was the, the, the leg of a woman, a leg of a body, uh, sticking out of the uh, shingle. And it was uh, Irene Munro. Uh, she'd, it seemed, taken up with uh, two local lads, uh, Graham and Field, and uh, uh, they were seen uh, walking together, or all three of them, along a Crumble's uh, track, and uh, that, that was the last she was seen. And the people who did see her remember uh, that she was wearing a very bright green coat, and it was actually known as the Green Coat Murder. So the, uh, uh, after uh, some police inquiries, these, these two lads, uh, local lads, as I say, one's about 28, one about 20, uh, were, were tracked down and they were uh, habitues of uh, this pub in Seaside, the public bar of the Albemarle Hotel, and they, they had been seen that evening with a bit more money than they normally had. Uh, uh, one of them had been seen with the walking cane that he normally, that he normally carried. And uh, it was uh, alleged that the walking cane had, had been the, the first point of the, of the attack. Um, to cut a long story short, uh, they, they gave all sorts of false alibis. And, but everything was actually circumstantial because the people who actually saw them walking uh, uh, failed to actually identify them at a subsequent uh, identity parade. Uh, but as I say, uh, evidence very much circumstantial. Uh, they went to court, there's one of them uh, going to court in Lewis, and they were found guilty. Probably an unsafe conviction these days, because as I say, everything was uh, circumstantial. And in fact, the jury uh, uh, decided in just one hour that both of them were guilty of murder, but asked the judge uh, to exercise mercy because they didn't feel... Uh, that it was premeditated. However, the judge didn't, and the two guys were hanged a few months later. Emily Kay uh, was uh, about 20 years older. She was about 37, 38. And uh, she'd uh, taken up with a chap called Patrick Marne, who, unknown to her, uh, was a bit of a rascal anyway. He'd been in uh, prison for bank ro robbery and fraud. But he was very much a, wo a womaniser, and she was just uh, one, it seemed, of uh, his uh, many conquests. They actually um, uh, set up uh, 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 in a holiday home together at uh, a bungalow uh, on the Crumbles, and uh, they, they, they sort of uh, uh, lived, lived as partners for just a few weeks, but Patrick Marne uh, would often go back to London to, to see his wife, because uh, that's the sort of chap uh, that he was. Uh, in the end, um, uh, she, uh, she didn't do very well, and she was actually killed by Marne. And uh, I cannot go into uh, the gruesome details in a talk like this, but um, uh, yes, she was, uh, let, let's say, um, divided into many pieces. And uh, Marne himself 
uh, was, was, was caught out actually by his wife. She suspected, as she, as she should have done, that he was uh, philandering somewhere. Uh, so she went through his suit pockets and she found a uh, ticket for the uh, left luggage at Victoria Station. A uh, uh, friend of her, hers was a transport policeman and he, he went along and uh, uh, actually uh, saw that the ticket belonged to a large Gladstone bag. When it was opened, it was full of um, uh, human blood and, and blood-stained uh, clothing. And apparently what, one of the things that Marne had been doing on his travels uh, back uh, from Eastbourne, he'd be loading bits of the unfortunate lady into the Gladstone bag and throwing them, throwing them out of the train window. Anyway, uh, he, uh, uh, Marne uh, uh, eventually uh, confessed to everything and the, the bungalow, and this became the bungalow murder, um, uh, again sort of hit the national headlines and uh, it was a, a great uh, source of uh, lo local attention. In fact, uh, an enterprising company uh, took over the rental of the bungalow, uh, ostensibly as a holiday home, but sort of uh, uh, charged people a shilling a time to go and look at uh, the, the gruesome inside. And in fact, it was so popular that after a few weeks, the admission price went up to one and twopence. So, how, what, how did this sort of uh, bleak area of the crumbles actually uh, become uh, what it is today? Quite interestingly, you go right back to 1887 and the council set up a Crumbles Harbour Committee to investigate uh, whether or not a harbour should be built, mainly for commercial purposes. And, um, it didn't get very far because there was massive local protests that the, the good folk coming to Eastbourne for their holidays certainly wouldn't want to stare at an ugly harbour even though it was three miles away uh, from uh, the, the Grand Parade. And then we, we, we have to wait about 80 years and an, a new urban plan for Eastbourne suggests the construction of a harbour village. Uh, all sorts of things had to happen legally uh, to bring that about and in fact an act of parliament was required but was rejected uh, mainly by uh, Labour MPs on all sorts of uh, grounds of uh, flooding all the rest of it. Not too many grounds uh, attached to the quality of its uh, environment and, and its ecology. But the plans did go through in 1980 uh, by which time the, the cost estimate had, had gone up uh, many fold and there were plans initially for 2,000 homes uh, which ended up as being 3,000 homes. The Asda supermarket and surrounding shops we know today uh, opened in 89 and then the sea locks were built and all the rest of it. So uh, that's the, uh, the program there and this is a, a couple of shots of the, of the work getting, getting underway and quite a bit of use actually made of the existing uh, uh, flooded areas uh, where uh, ballast, where shingle had uh, been extracted over the years anyway. So the, the actual process of uh, uh, building uh, the uh, parts of the harbour were reasonably simple. And again, we've got the, the Tonka toys on, on display. And uh, the actual harbour arm that gives sheltered water, uh, this, this, this took about two years to construct with a lot of the very large uh, rocks uh, actually coming from uh, Norway. And here we, you can see before they're open the, the sea locks themselves, really quite massive structures. You can see how large they are against a, a figure uh, standing at the bottom. And again, another shot. So we get to uh, the late uh, 18, uh, 1980s and uh, we, we start to see uh, the, the opening of uh, Asda and the commercial area uh, with the properties to follow. Now there are 3,000 properties uh, actually uh, in the uh, harbour area and quite unusually and I think that it's the only place in the country where residents are required uh, to pay a flood 
defence levy. It's not paid for by the rates, it's not paid for by the government. They have to pay their own levy. And they, they pay almost £300 a property. So 3,000 properties, that's almost a million pounds a year that's actually paid uh, by uh, the, um, the homes in this area. And here's, a, a, you can see the harbour in the sort on to the right of the picture. But outlined in red are not only the 3,000 properties in the harbour area, but the 17,000 properties in the larger Eastbourne area that would be flooded if the sea defences actually broke down. It just shows how vulnerable uh, parts of Eastbourne are and how vital this crumbles shingle bank is uh, to keeping everything protected. And of course, the people paying their £300 a year uh, quite resent that a lot of their money, uh, well, a lot of other uh, property are, are getting the benefit of it for nothing. So here's the, the harbour that we have today. Uh, this is only showing part of it, the South Harbour. The North Harbour is off to the left of the uh, picture. But uh, I think we're, we're very lucky here in having uh, 80 acres of open water. It really is a, a quite uh, significant uh, development. And uh, certainly this chap uh, thinks so. Nice to see things like seals uh, coming back to this area. So just to uh, complete uh, the story about the, the crumbles, this is the bit that's uh, nearer to uh, Eastbourne as we know it. Uh, the property in the bottom left of the picture is the Redoubt area. This map itself is about 1911. But you can see across the picture where it says Redoubt Ward uh, that uh, there's sort of really nothing uh, happening, happening there at all. So this is 1911. And at the uh, top of the picture, there's an area that was actually uh, given by uh, uh, Earl of Hartington, uh, 11 acres, that was actually given to the council in 1924 to help with the, uh, the homes for the labouring classes, as he put it. And here's a nice uh, aerial shot of uh, the first uh, uh, council houses uh, being built in this area. This is in the Vine Square uh, Fort Road area. And uh, a nice advert here for the, the steam laundry on the crumbles with its uh, lovely uh, open uh, drying grounds. And here's a picture taken actually from Archery Road, later to, to be called Channel View Road, and this is looking across the natural water feature of the Crumbles Pond. It's a natural feature with records going back to about 1280, uh, and it, it, it's, uh, it's only with uh, further work that it's become the boating pond that we know today. There's another picture of it. And Prince's Park itself was a conversion of that waste that we've see, just seen on that map, uh, opened in uh, 1931 by the Prince of Wales. And the Boating Lake uh, was a, a re-sculpting, I suppose, uh, of the uh, uh, initial uh, natural water feature that cost £10,000. And people uh, wrote to the local paper saying this is absolute madness, uh, nobody uh, will, would want to use it. But of course uh, it was well used. And I just want to uh, refer you to this. This is a, a, a very, a, really quite an early picture, might be 1920s, of the bowling green at Prince's Park with that large building in the background just on the edge of the beach. And it's this. Uh, this was uh, built around 1911, 1912, and this was a seaplane factory built here. So uh, I, I, I always wonder why it actually sort of came to Eastbourne because Eastbourne never made anything and all of a sudden it's got uh, a seaplane factory. And I think this is a, a lovely uh, shot of a, of a plane just about to be launched. You can see the, the bleakness of, 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 the, of the crumbles because quite deliberately this was uh, uh, located on the outskirts of Eastbourne. And the, the final thing is about the famous Crumbles trams. Uh, they came in 1955 and were here for 15 years or so. Uh, these, these, these were just leisure trams, just a two foot gauge. And they sort of like went from nowhere to nowhere, really. Uh, the, the ride was about 10 minutes there and 10 minutes back. 
but uh, very, very popular with holiday makers. Uh, certainly uh, between Whitson and September, these trams ran 12 hours a day from 10 until 10 and looked uh, quite interesting at night, uh, all lit up. And uh, there's just another shot. Uh, and at two shillings ago, this was uh, really quite expensive. But uh, uh, for all those people who uh, perhaps new to Eastbourne and say, oh, didn't you used to have a tram system? Well, no, not really. This was just sort of a, a holiday ride. So that's a, quite a, a quick skirt through uh, the Crumbles area and how it originated and what it used to be like and how it's actually uh, been used and been de developed over time. And uh, in my next talk, I'll be talking about the, the rest of Eastbourne's coast uh, from Prince's Park up to uh, Hollywell. Thank you very much for your attention.